Park? Why don't people like Jurassic Park 3? I don't know, but we should talk about it. Good idea. This is Collider Movie Club, and this is Jurassic Park 3. Welcome back to Collider Movie Club. I'm Coy. This is Perry. Before we get to Jurassic Park 3, I want to let you know that this episode of Collider Movie Club is brought to you by Movies Anywhere. Don't miss Movies Anywhere's biggest offer ever. From now until Monday, April 12th, purchase from thousands of movies through a connected, participating digital retailer, and you'll receive a digital code to redeem a bonus movie from the studio that released your purchase movie. Simply go to moviesanywhere.com slash redeem or press redeem in the Movies Anywhere app to enter the code and choose your free movie, then grab the popcorn and enjoy. Plus, if you already have one of the bonus movies in your collection, you can use the code for a free upgrade to HD or 4K if it's available. Reminder, this offer is good through April 12th. Some exclusions apply. Visit moviesanywhere.com slash bonus offer for all the details. So on today's very special edition of Movie Club, talking about one of my favorite franchises out there, we're bringing one of my favorites from Rotten Tomatoes. Now I feel bad that I'm playing favorites, but I love Joel so much. (laughs) Joel's a really big Jurassic and Scream fan, and Koi, you know how much that means to me. So Rotten Tomatoes editor-in-chief, Joel Mears, welcome to Movie Club. Thank you. It's my first time. I feel so honored, Um, and the feeling is mutual. Koi, I'm sure I'll grow to love you just as much. Well, we already have the Jurassic Park scream in common just by default, and they're only going to learn more. We're just going to grow. It's literally impossible not to love Koi. <laughs> this is I like I the things. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Do you guys want to start, I guess, with the big burning question here? I think we should. I think it's what the people demand. Why is Jurassic Park 3 a good movie? So I would argue... It's because we're comparing it to Jurassic Park 1 and 2 that it isn't seen as its own beautiful thing. So upon rewatch, I actually had a really good time going, okay, Lost World didn't happen. Jurassic Park didn't happen. I'm going to watch this movie about dinosaurs. And it was arguably like a greatest hits album. It felt like now that's what I call dinosaurs. You had so many things going on. It was a full amusement park ride. And I think the problem was everyone looks at the other movies and without this movie, we wouldn't have Jurassic World. And those movies made a billion dollars. And I think that's really helpful to look at it that way because it is a really good time if you remove all expectations. Yeah, I mean, I basically agree. I think the reason this movie is good is because it's not necessarily trying to be great, if that makes sense. So all this stuff that the first two films had uh, very Spielbergian sense of wonder, sort of slower pacing. We've all got to look up and admire these amazing creatures slash the great work that special effects artists have done and that were mind-blowing in 1993 and in the mid-90s. It sort of strips all that out and says, no, this is a B-movie. We're going on a roller coaster ride. We're going to give you monsters upon monsters upon monsters and maybe a monstrous human uh, every now and then. Um, and it's a relentless pace that doesn't really pause for that. And I think at the time of its release, 2001, that was a really smart thing to do because we could not be as sort of jaw dropped impressed by the special effects at that point because we were used to seeing them. So let's just get straight to the action. Let's get straight to the point. Um, And I think that's what makes it a really good film and a smart approach. So I'll throw in one more thing here. Something that happens when you have one of the best movies of all time precede you in Jurassic Park. I feel like a good movie, especially a movie in a franchise, needs to answer this question in a positive way. Does this movie meaningfully contribute to the franchise overall? And the answer is yes. At its core, this movie right here is working with the themes that were established in those first two movies, and it's also teeing up a lot of what's to come. I don't think you could have had a Spielberg movie without Spielberg, and I think as soon as they realized that, that probably started this movie down this trajectory, because they were able to grab set pieces for movies they didn't use, but then they just like put them with other ones, whereas other movies might have been like, let's try to do a Spielberg-esque film using these things he never got to use. This one was like, what if we take everything we were ever going to do, <laughs> cut it down to 90 minutes and just dance. And I, and I respect the boldness because they'd already broken the mold. If you watch Jurassic Park 1 now, it still holds up and it's been over 20 years. And that's saying a lot. Whereas this movie decided, hey, we can't top one. What if we go in another direction entirely? I think it was really smart for a franchise that early on. We're talking 01 to go, hey, if we change the flavor entirely, no one's going to expect blank. 
And that's how they got to Jurassic World. That's how they got to this billion dollar franchise by not going, let's copy what we've done. Now that doesn't always work. We won't talk about Alien 3, but it does work here because it is so kinetic and so much fun. And if you're a kid that likes dinosaurs, what do you want except this movie? 100% agree. It's got its rushed moments. I'm willing to admit that, but I feel like (laughs) the fact that this has a shorter running time compared to the other installments of the franchise definitely works in its favor because the shorter runtime goes hand in hand with that idea of it being a wilder, at times sillier thrill ride. You needed the two. Definitely. And I think, um, I think what Koi said about it having everything thrown in but then getting through it really, really quickly is, is really interesting. And it's actually in the setup and the writing is, is, is really smart, I think, because we very quickly establish the characters, right? We very quickly establish who and what they are and where they are in life for the people that we know, like uh, Dr. Grant, where suddenly we, we know instantly how he's feeling and how he's going to be placed in this story. And then the new characters are really sharply drawn. And so we get to, we get to then go on this adventure and get in the plane and get on with it. And you're right. Everyone in this film does know or appears to know exactly what kind of film they're in, right? It's very dialed up. All the performances feel, uh, you know, at the right pitch, but there are also harmonies going on. Um, you know, I believe Ta Leone, she's screaming at a 12 the whole time, which is great because the Spinosaurus is kind of behaving at a 12 the whole time whenever he's on screen. This one really leans hard into horror movie tropes, which I really, really enjoyed. Whether, and I know we're going to talk about some classic set pieces, but that Pteranodon that sort of looks back at the camera kind of like Freddy just looking up from his latest victim is so spot on with the tone of this film for me. But, and then when the uh, Spinosaurus, you know, lays waste to the T-Rex and that sort of hierarchy establishing moment and then sort of like crows about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm watching a slasher film here and I'm kind of here for it. Let's get, let's get moving. There are even qualities in Alan Grant that we didn't see in that first movie that come through here that basically let that character play in that zone, even though he came from a different movie with a somewhat different tone. When he's almost stepped on, like the way Alan screams there almost has a slightly like comedic, (laughs) exaggerated tinge to it. Whereas you don't really see that much in Jurassic Park, but here not only does it work, but it was absolutely necessary. Okay, it's dead. Nobody move a muscle. As a giant dinosaur fan, like Jurassic Park 1 came out when I was five. I was a dinosaur kid to a level that is unhealthy. I still have so many plastic dinosaur toys. They are very important to me. And I got so much out of this movie because this hit me right when I was 13. It gave us set pieces with Framing Lake Joe Johnston. So it didn't feel like it wasn't a movie. Like the shot of the, the Spinosaur across the, the way with the, the fence in the middle where it's perfectly still like predators actually are and then it charges That's a great ride moment, also a great movie moment, also a great horror movie moment. It balances so many tones and it's just so much fun. I think Joe Johnston deserves some credit for what he's done with this film. He's the kind of director who's made movies that you love, but maybe don't realize that he made them kind of thing. Like he's, you know, this is Joe Johnston made Jumanji, love, Captain America, the first Avenger. Um, He kind of, and he's, he's really good at capturing different tones, right? Because you think about those films, they all have quite, Uh, specific feels and different vibes, um, but they feel very consistent. Like Captain America, the first Avenger is to me uh, an almost perfect superhero movie in the way it captures that kind of nostalgia. And then Jumanji has that, you know, shows that he could have gone Spielberg in some ways if he wanted to with the neighborhood kids and the the sort of special effects. So this one is 49% on the tomato meter. Uh, tomato meter if we're going to go uh, Perry Perry style. That's perfectly in the middle. And it's been, you know, as new reviews are added, these scores change sometimes. So I know that that movie has been at 50%. I know it's been at slightly lower. Um, so that's, that's rotten, but it's only just rotten. The critics were relatively divided. I think some critics really wanted these sort of Spielbergian wonder and some were sort of grateful for this. You know, some people noted, as, as you noted earlier, that the ending is a bit rushed and and that kind of thing. But for the most part, that's just the score. When you go and read the reviews, which I always encourage people to do as, as the Rotten Tomatoes guy, 
I'm like, see what they're saying about the film because a lot of these same points that we're making about this being a really enjoyable adventure, even if it doesn't perhaps whelm as much as the first movie. And I think this is one of those films where there has been a number of revisionist sort of lookbacks in recent times, obviously with uh, Jurassic World and then Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. That's where it sits. It's, it's sort of split critics down the middle, but they, they also saw what we saw at the time. What I think is interesting is you were pointing out all of Joe Johnston's other works and all of them kind of have a Spielberg tone. So I can see why they hired him and then he went away from the Spielberg tone. So it's really interesting, like the Rocketeer, Jumanji, even the first Avenger in some ways have a very uh, Spielbergian, uh, uh, that, that swelling of strings, almost visual. But this one decided to go away from that. So it's really interesting that he consciously chose to leave the tone behind while building this new universe for the Jurassic franchise. It didn't feel like a copycat. And I think we got more fun action set pieces because it was a combination of so many things by the time it came out to the screens. I have many a set piece to highlight right now, but I will say (laughs) that even though this deviates from what Spielberg did, I am a big believer that the story and what the characters are doing in Jurassic Park 3 winds up serving as kind of the perfect middle point and the connector between those first two movies and then what people decide to do in the Jurassic World iteration of the franchise. But set pieces, in general, whether it's Jurassic or any other movie, I am always so into that opening, like really creepy, eerie setup set piece. And this one is as simple as watching the two of them parasailing and it's not even like you see all that much, but this sense of dread that that builds. And also as a kid who loved, you know, going away with my family and doing things like parasailing, I could just instantly connect to him in that moment, connect to Eric and just that sense of adventure and then how quickly it downturns. Every single one of these movies, I think, has a stellar opening set piece and this one's no different. 100%. And again, effective use of mist and sort of horror tropes. It's like just what you can't see. And then the sort of slight streak of blood. And this movie does announce its attentions from the moment the title card comes up because we don't have the typical John Williams swell. It's like, it's like you're about to witness some horror right now. I love the whole airplane sequence from the moment that the mercenary runs out onto the runway and it's kind of a punchline and gets chomped to them getting on, to the plane crashing, to the sort of great camera angles that Joe Johnston, shout out again, manages to utilize to sort of create the chaos of the spinning fuselage. Um, I think it's really fun. I always love uh, humans trapped in tight spaces being sort of snapped at uh, in Jurassic Park uh, franchises. So I was all about that, that sequence and felt that that established the first scene really established this is going to be a scary sort of film, I think, and, and we're going down this way. And this this film said, oh, it's also going to be quite fun and going to be quite rollicking, for, for lack of a better word. When you're following these humans along and then they reunite and there's a fence between them, you get the nostalgia of the fence. You get the awareness that they've just come from other patches of island. You get this great Spinosaurus moment. And then they run to more nostalgia with a familiar building. So I just love that they were able to play with all those tones and make it feel important. <laughs> Stupid jingle from the store, I heard it! My phone? Yeah, your satellite phone. Where is it? I don't have it. Well, when did you use it last? Uh, 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 on the plane. I got a call on the plane and... What? What? I loaned it to Nash. He must have had it when he... In addition to the evolution of the way that the Raptors look, the the series has also done a really good job of making sure every single installment teaches you a little bit about how they operate as well. We get the whole bit about the resonating chamber here, and that also leans right into exploring more how they all communicate, their relationship with their eggs, and what they're willing to do to get them back. So in addition to dinosaurs just being a cool thing to see on screen, Jurassic Park has turned out to be a pretty good vehicle for actually teaching people about these creatures as well. I really loved the evolutions in this film, the sort of resonating chamber. I also loved that this film foresaw 3D printing of such sophisticated (laughs) nature. You know, I felt like this sort of idea of evolution was well developed in this film and kind of sets us up for the kinds of plays on more interfered evolution that we get uh, in, in Fallen Kingdom and obviously Jurassic World before it. 
I do have a burning raptor question for both of you. How do you feel about the dream scene where the raptor says Alan's name? Okay, so that to me happens so early on, it sets up the silliness that is necessary for this movie to have the tone it does. We've talked about the horror elements. We've talked about those things. You can still have a very uh, majestic horror movie. It's hard. I'd love to see a Terrence Malick horror movie, but it's possible. You would not be able to have a B movie without the silliness at the jump. Like the opening of this movie has, you know, the great opening set piece, but then it immediately goes to the more human elements. Alan Grant dealing with the college students and that fun bit of like how far the world's evolved. You've got Laura Dern in the opening, so you can see their relationship grow. You get a lot of humility and humanity from the opening opening, the first act. You need the Alan for the movie to really work after that because you've gone from you know humanity and, and the opening sequence you need to go like okay we're approaching the island this raptor is going to talk to dr grant let's dance jp3 <laughs> I, I i agree i'm into the talking raptor um i feel that was johnston sort of set, putting his cards on the table putting down the gauntlet and say this is exactly what we're doing here and also on the raptor front though it's quite a character development thing as well like i think we we need to also acknowledge that the man's pretty traumatized um, and he's going back to this environment that is a central source of his trauma. So it is not unrealistic that this might be the daydream he has as he naps on his way back to the source of his uh, you know, defining life experience. I am so glad you brought that up, Joel, because I do know that it, it plays for a bit of a laugh in the movie, and we had never seen anything quite like that in any other Jurassic film, but that is the truth of it. How many times have you had a dream of, I don't know, like a talking pet or something like seriously outrageous? And when you connect the dots of everything that Alan's been through over these two films, they do very much pave the way to him having that kind of moment right before he is at least thinking he is just flying over the island again. So it does make sense. I'm sure he's had many dreams like that and I, I want to see them all. I, <laughs> I want to see when he comes back for Dominion, there better be a dream because I want to see him dream <laughs> Spinosaurus. I want to see him dream Pteranodons and, uh, and Kylosauruses. I just want all of them and I want them chatting. I want that sort of like, what's the, uh, the, the painting of the dogs playing poker? I want a whole conversation with the various JP3 uh, dinosaurs and that would, that would satisfy me and feel logical. You know, it's not just done for fun and games. The Jurassic Park movies have some very realistic, meaningful themes that I think we can all identify with, even if it isn't necessarily as as we would execute them in relation to uh, having dinosaurs existing on the planet. But it's pretty much the idea that humanity can't help but to continue making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I think in, in one sense, Jurassic Park 3 in particular does a really great job making sure that that idea stays alive to well support the idea of Jurassic World ever existing at all. And I think we see that a lot in uh, in uh, Eric in the movie and also with um, with Billy as well. The drive to take the eggs. I, I know that someone's instinct might be like, what are you doing, you dummy? Why did you take the raptor eggs? But then it all kind of comes together when Alan gives that speech to Eric towards the end, right before they drive by on the boat, all those nice dinosaurs. I have a theory that there are two kinds of boys. There are those that want to be astronomers and those that want to be astronauts. The astronomer, the paleontologist, gets to gets to study these amazing things from a place of complete safety. But then you never get to go into space. Exactly. It's the difference between imagining and seeing, be able to touch them. And that's, that's all that Billy wanted. The movie in the end justifies the fact that we are always going to be drawn to reach for things like that, even though we've seen the past mistakes and what's happened, but that itch to reach out and touch is always going to be there. So it's always possible we're going to continue to make these same mistakes again. So it just basically sets up that continued interest in seeing real live dinosaurs in a park form in Jurassic World and also the human temptation to explore what they're fascinated by even further, even if they wind up taking it a little too far. 
And I think this movie does a great job with the last moments of the Pterodons escaping. I think the movie does a great job with exploring beyond humanity making the same mistakes. It, it is a human study. It's just, it's wrapped around a, a more of a B movie than people realize. Even, you know, Grant's evolution, he's now friends with kids. I love his relationship with the kid that calls him Dinosaur Man. After the whole first movie, he's fighting loving kids. We see the arc of him liking the two kids on the island, but this movie, we see that land. We see the evolution of Laura Dern's character and their relationship. Even in those two small scenes, we see Grant grow up enough to trust in someone else in Laura Dern with like a 30 second phone call, knowing she'll do the right thing. We see, you know, him trusting in institutions a scotch more but he's still a guy that made a dumb decision about money he's still a guy that like sacrificed everything that he knew was right to do this exact same mistake again so i love that it's it's balancing all those things in a character that we love sam neill has said he didn't understand dr grant until this performance he didn't understand who alan grant was until this movie which i always found interesting because i was like bro sam neill you're a master in the first one what are you talking about but in this movie, we get to see so much more character. And I don't feel like that's discussed enough. His relationship with Billy only exists because of the first movie. And Billy only exists because of the failures of humanity in the first movie. And all of that comes to a beautiful moment in a speech with a child, which he wouldn't have had if he hadn't survived learning to like kids in the first movie. It's this great culmination of Dr. Grant through the lens of humanity failing. But me as an optimist seeing like, yeah, but look at how Grant has grown. There is hope. It's bonding over giant, giant cans of beans that help you in this situation. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think what this film, in the same way that it strips back a lot of the elements of the previous films to move at a fast pace, it does really narrow this idea of human folly down to very almost small scale, um, you know, personal motivations as opposed to large corporate motivations, which are the focus of uh, the two previous films and often in Jurassic World. So if you look at what's motivating the characters, it's it's Dr. Grant needs money. It's it's the is Aladdin with the lamp. He can't not touch. He's that kind of person. He's an astronomer. Uh, and then it's these two people who aren't bringing an army because they want to start onto this island because they want to kickstart the business and, and, and create another Jurassic World, Jurassic Park. They're just looking for their kid, right? And they're pretty like, they're just like your average divorcees, right? I mean, he could be the guy from Fargo really without the slightly evil intent. And so it's really small scale human drama here that's playing out, but all of the themes that sort of run thread-like throughout the franchise, uh, all of those things you spoke about, Perry, um, are tied to all of these individuals. It's just, again, focused in small scale. And what's interesting is that going to have a secondary storyline where the pteranodons were going to go to the mainland and terrorize there as Grant was on the island for another reason and it was going to be a bit big and then um, David Coep came in and was like no we need to narrow the focus here let's make a human family story let's declutter and let's focus and they didn't sacrifice any of the uh, the human drama or the themes that underpin the franchise by doing that I think in fact they created quite a unique gem um, within the franchise. I couldn't agree more. That was very well said, Joel. And I'm pretty sure it lands us in a place where we have fully convinced everybody out there that Jurassic Park 3 truly is a good movie, right? Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm think convinced. <laughs> that's all that matters. We're convinced. Joel, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Movie Club. I'm so happy to have you here, in particular for this one. <laughs> Uh, it's been such a pleasure. It was such a joy to rewatch this film. I'm so excited about Dominion. Um, we're going to see Grant again. Uh, thanks, Koi. I think I think it's the start of a beautiful, long friendship. <laughs> Before we close this episode out, do not forget that this edition of Collider Movie Club is brought to you by Movies Anywhere. As part of their biggest offer ever, Movies Anywhere is giving users a bonus movie for new qualifying purchases. What exactly does that mean for you? Well, if you purchase today's movie club entry, Jurassic Park 3, you can then choose from one of Universal's bonus movies to add to your collection. Koi, I know you got a recommendation, so what are you suggesting right now? If you have somehow never seen Universal's Pitch Perfect, it is acatastic. It is so much fun. It is heartwarming. It is a great coming of age movie with great songs and pop culture. It's like a now album from your entire childhood for your spirit. I love Pitch Perfect. I am going to go ahead and recommend Happy Gilmore. 
As a kid who grew up playing golf, I feel like Happy Gilmore taught me a lot of what I know about golf. I'm sorry if that insults my mother, but who doesn't like to get up to the tee and just smack that ball hockey style? See, I told you I learned all my skills from Happy Gilmore. That's why I'm a great golfer. Not really, but it doesn't matter. You should still watch the movie because it is a ton of fun. So if you want to take advantage of Movies Anywhere's biggest offer ever, go to moviesanywhere.com slash bonus offer for all the details. That is it. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Collider Movie Club. We'll see you soon.